Section 21 of The Influence of Monarchs by Frederick Adams Woods This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Appendix 1, Part 2 Bibliography for Denmark A. Encyclopedia Britannica, 9th and 11th editions A. Allen, C.F. Histoire de Denmark, 2 volumes, Copenhagen, 1878. B. Bain, R.N., Scandinavia, A History of Denmark, Norway and Sweden, Cambridge, 1905. C. Dunham, S.A., History of Denmark, Sweden and Norway. Lardner's Cabinet Cyclop, 3 volumes, London, 1839. Out of date but convenient for broad statements of such facts as go undoubted. D. Weitmeyer, H., Editor, Denmark, is History, etc., London, 1898. E. Cox, W. Travels into Poland, Russia, Sweden, and Denmark. Cox has the reputation of being very partial in his estimates of royalty. Three volumes, 1784. F. Wright. J. H. Editor. History of All Nations, 24 volumes. Philadelphia, 1905. G. Dahlman. F. C. Geschichte von Denmark. In Geschichte der Europäischen Staaten, Herren und Erkert, 5 Volumes, Hamburg, 1840-1902. Positive, Voldemar IV. Considered to be a man of genius, great in war and statecraft, shrewd, energetic, indefatigable, made everybody work, arbitrary and tyrannical in his nature. 1340-1375, positive. Various regions were consolidated and reunited under a strong and orderly rule. Denmark became a powerful state. Construction of many roads, canals, mills, castles, and fortresses. The wars were successful except with the Hanseatic lead. Bosiv, Margaret, regent and queen. Of remarkable ability, prudent, vigorous, and despotic. Not much known of her private character. 1375 to 1412, positive. Sweden subjugated and consolidated with Denmark and Norway. Schleswig recovered. Peace and order were maintained. Negative, Eric. Weak, incapable, cruel, capricious, and violent. 1412 to 1439. Loss of territory, disasters, and defeats. Revolts of the people. Eric deposed. Neutral. Christopher the Third. There is very little in history concerning his personal traits. He said to have had an enlightened mind. 1440 to 1448. Neutral. Brief and unimportant reign. Comparative peace and prosperity. Copenhagen grew in importance. Loss of influence over Sweden and Schleswig. Liberty of the peasantry declined. Neutral, Christian I. Active and brave, though of mediocre ability. Liberal, humane, amiable, and pious. 1448 to 1481, neutral. No marked advance or decline. Sweden subjugated, and then again lost. Finances in a bad condition. Neutral, John. Mild, prudent, reasonable, popular. Subject at times to melancholia, which bordered on insanity. 1481 to 1513, neutral, positive. Wars with Sweden which came to no profit. Disastrous invasion of Dittmarsh. Navy enlarged, finances improved, and various treaty with the Hanseatic towns. Positive. Christian II. Intellectual and extremely bold and enterprising. A friend of the lower classes. Excessively cruel and obstinate. Mentally unbalanced at times. 1513 to 1523. Positive. Improved jurisprudence and increase in commerce. Better condition of the peasantry. Oppression of the nobles led to revolts and flight of the king. Sweden subdued, and then, 1520 to 1523, gradually under the leadership of Gustavus Vasa, threw off the Danish yoke. Neutral, Frederick I. Of moderate ability with good sense. Cautious, crafty, and peace-loving. Most striking virtues or vices. 1523 to 1533, neutral. Events of the Reformation. No marked progress or decline in material conditions. Discontent among the peasantry. Negative. Interregnum. Government divided. 1533 to 1534. Negative. Civil wars, violence, and cruelties. Positive. Christian III. A good ruler, patient, industrious, with strong common sense. 1532 to 1559. Positive. Comparative peace and prosperity, commerce increased, several wise laws enacted. Neutral. Frederick II. Of mediocre ability, tactful and popular. Frederick II was assisted by many able ministers. 1559 to 1588, positive. Increased international prestige, better financial condition, more commerce and industry, 
many public buildings erected. Subjection of Ditmarsh. Negative. Minority of Christian IV. Regency divided. 1588 to 1596. Positive. Order and prosperity maintained. Positive. Christian IV. Brave, active, vigorous, able, magnanimous, with the highest sense of duty. He is the best known king of Danish history. His nature, however, was overambitious, selfish, and sensuous. 1596 to 1648. Neutral. In the first part of this reign, Denmark enjoyed much commercial and industrial advance, and many internal improvements. In the last part, she suffered severely from foreign wars, especially in her conflicts with Gustavus Adolfus of Sweden. Neutral. Frederick III. An enigmatical character, shrewd and calculating, brave on occasion, mild, prudent, and mild, charged with selfishness and duplicity. 1648 to 1670. Neutral. In the early part of the reign, there were wars with Sweden, in which the Danes lost territory. After that, internal conditions somewhat improved. From this reign and until 1848, Denmark became one of the most absolute monarchies in Europe. Christian IV. Brave but weak and incapable, good-natured and popular, but extravagant and devoted to ease and pleasure. 1670 to 1699. Neutral. Wars with Sweden. Barren of results. Commercial advance and better navy. Decline in agriculture, finances and conditions of the peasantry. Weak diplomatic position. Positive, Frederick IV. Vigilant, able, and successful. Amiable, popular, and well-meaning. Immoral in his private life. Accused of unprincipled ambition. 1699 to 1730. Positive. General prosperity. Schleswig acquired and annexed to Denmark. Physical condition much improved. Many schools built. Condition of peasantry. Ameliorated. Serfdom abolished. Neutral, Christian VI. Mediocre ability. Diligent and sincere. Ruled by others, shy, sickly, and mildly melancholy, benevolent and pious. 1730 to 1746, neutral. A period of peace, growth of industries, a better navy, decline in finances, agriculture, and liberty of the peasantry. Neutral, Frederick IV. Intelligent but not brilliant, moderate, well meaning, and conscientious. 1746 to 1766, positive. Condition of peace continued, commerce industry advanced. Agriculture and the peasantry in a bad way, but improvement was shown during the last part of the reign. Negative. Christian VIII. Weak and ignorant. Anticipated degenerate. Practically insane. 1766 to 1808. Positive or neutral. The sweeping reforms of Struency occupied the last part of this reign. They were of questionable value. Last part of the reign was progressive. Bibliography for Sweden. A. Encyclopedia Britannica, 9th and 11th editions. B. Biographie Universelle, 85 volumes. C. La Grande Encyclopédie, 31 volumes, 1886-1902. D. Brockholz, Conversations Lexicon. A. Gege E.G., The History of the Swedes, translated by J.A. Turner and London. First portion, comprising first three volumes of the original from the earliest periods to the ascension of Charles X. Continuation, see French or German editions, 1845. A.A. Geiger, E.G. Geschichte Swedens. In Hirun und Eckert, Geschichte der Europäischen Staaten. Four volumes. Hamburg, 1832. Kolta, 1855. B. Dunham, S.A. History of Denmark, Sweden and Norway. Lardner's Cabinet Cyclop. Three volumes. London, 1839. Out of date but useful to compare with modern opinions. C. Beer et of Algemein Geschicht der Wurthadels, three volumes, Wien, 1860-84. D. Wright, J. H., editor. History of All Nations, 24 volumes, Philadelphia, 1995. E. Cox, W. Travels in Poland, Russia, Sweden and Denmark, three volumes, 1794. F. Bain, R. Nisbet, Scandinavia. A Political History of Denmark, Norway and Sweden from 1513 to 1900, Cambridge, 1905. G. Bain, Ardenibit. History of Charles XII, New York, 1895. H. Sundberg, Gustav, Editor. Sweden, its people and its industry, Historical and Statistical Handbook, published by order of the government, Stockholm, 1904. J. Carlsen, F.F. Geschichte Sweden's Continuation of Geiger, three volumes, Gotha, 1875-1887. K. Stavenau, Ludwig. Geschichte Sweden's, 1718-1772. 
the seventh volume and continuation of the work of Geiger and Carlson in Hirren and Uckert, etc. series. Gotha, 1908. Ruler, positive, Gustavus Vasa, a man of very high ability, brave, cautious, economical, and extremely industrious, stern, just, and even tyrannical, but virtuous and popular. Condition of country, 1525 to 1560, positive. Sweden won her independence from Denmark. Law and order maintained. Increase in commerce. Considerable progress in agriculture and mining. Taxes alleviated. Neutral, Eric IV. Of brilliant mental endowments. A very good orator, poet, musician and painter. Devoid of practical wisdom. An incompetent ruler. Suspicious, violent, cruel and headstrong. Began at times mentally deranged. 1560 to 1568, negative. Public treasure wasted. Most general discontent and suffering. Reign ended in a rebellion in which Airy was deposed. Neutral, John the Third, Learned and gifted as a student. As a rule, his position is doubtful. An unbalanced mind. Violent, selfish, dishonorable, extravagant. 1568 to 1592. Neutral. Much disorder and want of economy. Industry made little progress. Events of the Catholic reaction. Wars of Russia, which led to some conquests along the Baltic. Negative. Sigismund. Weak and bigoted. They were alleviated in literature and the arts. Unreliable, willful and obstinate, devoid of excessive force. 1592 to 1595, negative. Religious disturbances continued. Negative, Sigismund, and positive, Duke Charles, afterwards Charles IX. Charles added as a regent for Sweden. Sigismund was king of Poland. 1595 to 1600, negative. Religious and personal warfare between Charles and Sigismund, the latter deposed. Positive, Charles IX, strong, decisive, and sagacious, sails to promote the interests of his people, yet severe in the exercise of his power, and subject to violent fits of passion, unscrupulous in his methods. 1600-1611, positive. Successful diplomacy, commerce, manufacturers, and mining flourished, improved judiciary, unsuccessful war with the Danes in the last years of his reign. Positive, Gustavus Adolphus, of exceptional genius great warrior and statesman, adorned by his subjects for his many noble virtues. 1611 and 1632, positive. Marked growth of Sweden's international prestige, great improvement in the army, which gained many brilliant victories. Acquisition of Ingria, Riga, and a part of Karelia. Prosperity in all economic conditions. Negative. Minority of Christina, Regency divided. Oxenstierna, a non-royal statesman at the head of affairs. 1632-1644, positive. Sweden continued to play a successful part in the Thirty Years' War. Reforms in the internal administration. Manufacturers, especially of arms and ammunition, were in a flourishing condition. Positive, Christina. Superior intellect and many learned accomplishments. Her character was extremely erratic. Mistrustful, haughty, satirical, passionate and licentious. 1644-1654, positive or neutral. Successful termination of the wars with Denmark, 1645, and also the Thirty Years' War, 1648, in which Sweden obtained the duchies of Bremen, Verden, and most of Pomerania, and Wismar. Sweden, very high among the nations, in the last years came in general discontent and peasant uprising. Positive, Charles X, extremely brave and enterprising, an able general, in the main just, though prone to fits of anger, 1654-1660, positive. Denmark forced to give up Scania, Helland, Blekinge, and other territories. Sweden maintained her international prestige. The wars were, however, burdensome. Negative, minority of Charles XI, Regency divided. 1660-1672, neutral. Increased trade and industry, especially iron and silver. Improved jurisprudence. Livonia acquired by Sweden. On the other hand, there was much fermenting discontent among the lower classes. The finances were very badly managed. The foreign policy was weak. Sweden playing into the hands of France. Positive. Charles XI. Ambitious and energetic, with high political ability. Chaste, temperate, economical, anxious for the welfare of his country. He was, however, stubborn and severe, and considered by many an unprincipled tyrant. 1672 to 1697. Positive. From 1672 to 1679, a period of wars in which Sweden was at first humiliated but finally victorious. The latter part of the reign, peace and prosperity with marked progress in commerce and industry, 
improve financial condition, attained, however, by measures injurious to a certain minority of the subjects. Negative. Minority of Charles the Twelfth. Regency divided. Count Piper, Prime Minister, in fact, though not in name. April 5th, November 6th, 1697. Neutral or positive. Dissensions and disturbances. Diplomatic strength fairly well maintained. Good financial management continued. Positive. Charles XII. Extraordinary martial genius. His ambition was madness, and his valour was ferocity. Rude but chaste, simple in his mode of living. Indifferent monarch, but a great soldier. 1697-1718. Negative. Foreign wars which brought misfortune and poverty upon the country. Decline in trade, industry, and agriculture. Some excellent civil and criminal laws were enacted. Lost the Baltic provinces to Russia. Negative. Ulrico and Anor. Deficient in courage and talent. Considered to have a penchant for intrigue and a vindictive nature. She is credited with domestic virtues. March 1719, April 1720. Negative. Loss of Bremen and Verdine to Hanover. But these and other events belong to the treaties which close the wars of Charles XII. Frederick I, well-meaning but weak and lazy, politically a non-entity. 1720-1751, positive, then negative. First twenty years were peaceful and progressive under the direction of Horn. Increase of commerce, trade, mining and general exports. Kingdom placed in a better state of defence. In 1741, Sweden fought a ridiculous and unsuccessful war with Russia. In 1743, humiliating peace of Abo, by which Sweden lost eastern Finland. Negative or positive. Adolphus Frederick. Mentally inferior, weak and indecisive. Mild, temperate and peace-loving. 1751-1771. Negative. Country in a state of lethargy. Its international influence had become insignificant. Internal commotions, decline in manufacturers, peasantry oppressed. Government became notoriously corrupt. Positive. Gustavus III. Brilliant, accomplished, energetic and versatile. In addition to his talent as a statesman, he was distinguished as a poet and dramatist. His life was governed by selfish ambition. His disposition was harsh, arrogant, and imperious. 1771 and 1792, positive. Revival agriculture, industry and commerce. Beneficial reforms in the administration of justice. Bibliography for Russia. A. Le Grand Encyclopedia. B. Encyclopedia Britannica, 9th and 11th editions. C. Brockhaus, Conversations Lexicon. A. Rembold Alfred, History of Russia from the Earliest Times to 1877, translated by L. B. Lang, two volumes, London. B. Strahl und Hermann, Geschichte der Russian States in Hiren and Okat Series, seven volumes, Edinburgh and Gotha, 1839-66. C. Kelly, Walter K., The History of Russia, compiled from the works of Karamsin, Tulk and Segur. Two volumes, London, 1854, out of date. D. Beer, Adolf. Allgemeine Geschichte des Wilthandels. Three volumes, Wien, 1860-84. E. Solovev, S.M. Histoire de Russie. Translated from the Russian by the Princess Sovorov, Paris, 1879. F. Bain R. Nisbet. Slavonic Europe, A Political History of Poland and Russia from 1447 to 1796. Cambridge, 1908. G. Morfil, W.R. Russia. In the Story of the Nation series, London, 1904. H. Walizewski, K. Le Bureau de la Dynastie, Les Premiers Romanov, 1613-1682, Paris, 1909. J. Ralston, W.R.S. Early Russian History, London, 1874. K. Bain, R.N. The First Romanovs, London, 1905. L. Wolosiewski K. The Romance of an Empress. Catherine II of Russia, translated from the French, two volumes, London, 1894. M. Wolosiewski K. Le Heritage de Pierre le Grand Regine des Femmes, Gouvernement des Favoris. 1725-1741, Paris, 1900. N. Wolosiewski K. Le Creuse Revolutionnaire, 1584-1614, Paris, 1906. O. Moraville, W.R. History of Russia from the Birth of Peter the Great to Nicholas II, London, 1902. P. Bain, J.N. The Pupils of Peter the Great, Westminster, 1897. Q. 
Bain, J.N., The Daughter of Peter the Great, Westminster, 1899. R. Wolosky K., La Dernière des Romanov, Paris, 1902. Ruler, Positive, Ivan III the Great. Cool, resolute, deliberate and economical, a skillful diplomatist, stealthy and cunning in his methods, tyrannical and passionate. Condition of country, 1462 to 1505, positive. Russia founded as an empire and consolidated. Conquest of Novgorod, Bulgaria, and a part of Lithuania. Acquisition of Tver, Rostov, Yaroslav, and Kazan. Army and finances strengthened. Considerable building activity. Neutral. Vasily V. Not brilliant, but possessed industry, prudence, tenacity, and diplomatic cunning. Very autocratic in his rule. 1505-1533, positive or neutral. Strength of the empire maintained. Some reversions at the hands of the Tartars, but at the end the country was enlarged and strengthened. Many hardships endured by the people, such as famines, fires, and pestilences. Successful foreign diplomacy. Neutral or positive. Minority of Ivan IV. Helen Glinska, stepmother of Ivan IV, regent. Able and resolute, but unpopular and immoral. 1533 to 1538, neutral. Not an important period. Despotic authority and order maintained in spite of court intrigues. Minor wars in Lithuania and Crimea. Negative. Minority of Ivan IV, Regency divided. 1538 to 1547, negative. Intrigues, uprisings and disorders. Tardis harried the empire. State treasury plundered. Positive. Ivan IV the Terrible. Energetic and very able, especially in statecraft. Was merciless and dissolute, notoriously cruel and superstitious, especially the last part of his life, when he became virtually a madman. 1547-1584, positive. Kazan and Astrakhan conquered and annexed. Siberia invaded and partially subdued. Many churches built. Some increase in foreign trade. Famine and pestilence in 1570. Not all the wars were successful. Moscow was burned by the Tatars in 1574. Native. Fyodor I. Extremely weak-minded, had a good character, pious and philanthropic. Boris Godunov, the real ruler. See below. 1584-1598. Positive. Empire strengthened. Tatars repulsed. Spelman's fortified. Archangel built. Swedes driven into Narva. Further subjugation of Siberia. Commercial relations broadened. Peasantry bound to the soil and consequent depopulation. Positive. Boris Godunov, brother in law of Fyodor I. Great capacity and unbounded ambition. A tyrant. Cunning, unscrupulous and suspicious, but not wantonly cruel. Patronized literature. 1598 to 1605. Neutral or positive. Externally, Russia's diplomatic position strengthened. Internally, a great commotion during the last six months attending the false Demetrius. Great famine, 1601 to 1603. Depopulation among the peasantry, but there was an influx of desirable foreigners. Positive. Minority of Fedor II. A youth of 16, murdered in less than two months. Reign may be considered minority with the power divided. April 13, 1605, June 1, 1605. Negative. Treasons and conspiracies. Neutral. Demetrius. Ambitious, courageous, accomplished, versatile, but imprudent. Good-natured, affable, and well-meaning. Magnificent and extravagant. 1605, May 18, 1606. Establishment of a more peaceful condition of affairs and many beneficial laws, soon followed by a conspiracy in which Demetrius was murdered. Treasury depleted. Neutral or negative. Vasily, Basil, Shuisky. A crafty and scrupulous intriguer. Timid in action, faithless and unpopular. A nervous little old man, very shrewd and very stingy. 1606 to 1610, negative. Russia invaded by the Poles, general confusion. Tartars plundered the border. Negative. Interregnum, 1610 to 1613, negative. Anarchy for two years followed by the expulsion of the Poles. Civil disorder, however, continued until 1613. Treasury plundered. Neutral. Michael Romanov ruled jointly with his father. Positive. Fyodor. Ferret, from 1617 to 1633. Michael was an amiable, honourable, conscientious prince of mediocre or perhaps superior capacity. Fyodor Ferret, of similar temperament and equally virtuous, was highly endowed with wisdom and ability. 
1613 to 1645, positive. Internal condition of the country somewhat improved, especially in the condition of the people, in commerce, manufacturers, and the army. Population increased through the introduction of many desirable foreigners. Negative. Minority of Alexis. Boris Morisov in control. 1645 to 1650. Neutral positive. Much oppression. Injustice and discontent. Several insurrections and riots. On the other hand, the army was improved and the frontiers strengthened. Neutral positive. Alexis. About the average of mental capacity, a well-balanced mind. Very industrious and conscientious. He is especially noted for his good nature, humanity and gentle, courteous behaviour. Good husband and father. 1650 to 1676, positive. In spite of troubles, the reign was doubly a period of progress. Codification of the laws, incorporation of the country of the Cossacks, the territory gained from Poland, minor rebellions put down, trade and foreign relations broadened. Finance, however, remained in a bad condition. Negative. Theodore III. Reign from the age of 14 to 20 years. May be considered as a minority or divided regency. 1676 to 1682, positive. Successful wars with the Tartars. Several forms, one of which, the abolition of the Maest Nichezestro, was important. Neutral or positive, minority of Ivan and Peter the Great, Sofia Regent. A remarkable person of exceptional courage, force and much ability. Historians differ in their estimate of her moral character. Some picturing her as unscrupulous, cruel and licentious. Others as comparatively blameless. 1682 to 1689, negative. A period of confusion and massacres. Insurrection of the Stilites. Unsuccessful expedition against the Tartars. Positive, Peter the Great. Extraordinary ability, willpower and energy. Impulsive, passionate, tyrannical, but often clement. Coarse, brutal, licentious, epileptic. 1689 to 1725, positive. Order established with a firm hand. Addition of the territories of Little Russia, Livonia, Ethonia, Ingria, and a part of Finland. Seaports obtained. St. Petersburg founded. Foundation of a navy. Improvement of the army. Increase of manufacturers, commerce, and the liberal arts. Negative or neutral. Catherine I. Ignorant, unambitious, though shrewd and sensible. Nor much political ability or inclination to direct the helmless state. Life indolent and intemperate. Gentle in disposition and very humane. 1725 to 1727, positive. A peaceful reign without marked internal change. Diplomatic relations strengthened with Austria and Germany. Taxes reduced. Positive. Minority of Peter II. Regency in the hands of a council. 1727 to 1730, neutral. Intrigues in the court. No marked advance or decline. Maurice of Saxony prevented from getting possession of Courland. Diplomatic apathy. Negative. And Ivanovna. Had a fair natural intelligence, but her mind was narrow and uneducated. Many bad traits of character, sullen, vindictive, selfish and sensuous. Laziness, alternated with bursts of energy. 1730 to 1740, neutral positive. Reforms in the army, poor condition of the navy, canals and public roads built. Successful intervention in the affairs of Poland. War with the Turks, not especially successful, but Russia gained a few towns, though at much expense. 20,000 persons said to have been banished to Siberia. Increased taxation and oppression. Minority of Ivan VI, Regency of Byron. October 28, 1740, November 20, 1740. A short period without any special significance overthrow of Byron's Regency. Negative. Minority of Ivan VI, Anne Leopoldovna, Regent. Indolent, timid and very incapable. Lacking ambition. Lived in seclusion. Dissolute and slothful. Except her natural mildness and not a single quality which could, by any possibility, command respect or admiration. November 20, 1740 to December 6, 1741. Neutral. A short period. Intrigues of violence soon led to the overthrow of Anne, Ivan VI, and their party. Swedes defeated. September 3, 1741, but the Russians did not follow up their victory. Neutral positive. Elizabeth. Uneducated, but possessed a very keen mind. Indolent and selfish. Capricious and indulgent. Good-natured but subject to outbursts of passion and anger, extravagant and extremely licentious. 1741-1762, positive. Pomerania and the southern part of Finland acquired. Increase of commerce and manufacturers. Improvements in banking. Siberia began to be peoples, much tyranny, 
A large number of persons banished to Siberia, truly exhausted through extravagancies. Many public buildings erected. Native, Peter III. Half imbecile, weak, dissolute, violent, was however called good-hearted, indolent. January 5th, 1762, July 10, 1762. Indol. Brief reign, several legal forms. Abolition of the secret court of police and of summon of police. Some improvement in the navy and army. Many talented Frenchmen banished from the country. Much discontent and sedition, ending in a revolution. Positive, Catherine II. Extraordinary character, ambitious and courageous. Had great enthusiasm, resolution, natural wit and insight. Charming in manner, with boundless good humour. But was heartless, unscrupulous and extremely licentious. 1762-1796, positive. Important conquests in the south and west. Part of Poland, the Crimea, the Kuban, Courland, and a part of the frontiers of Turkey added to Russia. Legal reforms regarding the administration of justice. Population industry increase. Financial exhaustion. Increased international prestige. Internal administration not so good. Poor condition of the army. Negative. Poor. Foolish, arrogant, almost insane in his capricious eccentricities. Fits of benevolence alternating with tyranny. 1796 to 1801, negative. Decline in national prestige. Nation brought to the verge of bankruptcy. Decline in exports of raw material. Great perversion of justice. Small territory of Georgia annexed in 1799. Bibliography for Prussia. A. Allgemeine Deutsche Biographie, 52 volumes. Leipzig, 1875-1906. B. Encyclopedia Britannica, 9th and 11th editions. C. Brockhaus. Conversation Sexicon. D. Le Grand Encyclopédie, 31 volumes, Paris, 1896-1902. A. Tuttle, Herbert. History of Prussia, 4 volumes, Boston, 1884-1896. B. Rank, L. Von. Swolf, Butcher, Procesher, Geschichts, 5 volumes, Leipzig, 1877-1879. C. Troisen, I. G. Geschichte der Prussischen Politik, 14 volumes, Berlin and Leipzig, 1868, 1886. D. Pratz Hans, Prussische Geschichte, 3 volumes, Stuttgart, 1900-1901. E. Rank Ilvon, History of the Reformation in Germany, 3 volumes, London, 1847. F. Berner Ernst, Geschichte des Precision States, two volumes, Munchen, 1891. G. Beer, Adolf. Algemeine Geschichte des Wethenders, three volumes, Wien, 1860. H. Voigt, Frederick. Geschichte des Brandenburgisch Precision States, two parts, Berlin, 1867. J. Pearson W. Prechisch Geschicht, sei bent, verbesset, und vermhört auch Fleisch. Two volumes, Berlin, 1898. K. Levi Z. Etudos sur la histoire de Presse. Paris, 1890. L. Rank, L. Von. Memories of the House in Brandenburg and History of Prussia during the 17th and 18th centuries. Translated, three volumes, London, 1849. Ruler. Positive. Frederick I. Vigorous, able, masterful, popular, tactful, good-hearted, but without any higher sense of honour. One of the best scholars in Germany. Condition of country. 1415 of 1440. Positive. Peace and order largely secured for the first time in many years. Turgulant nobles suppressed. Wars against Mecklenburg and Pomerania generally successful. The Oakenmark again united to Brandenburg. Neutral. Frederick II. Son of Frederick I. Careful and thoughtful. Determined in pressing his claims. Not inclined to warfare. Of an ill, pious, melancholy temperament. Tenacity of purpose. Was his most noteworthy trait. 1440 to 1470. Neutral or positive. Further consolidation. Pretentious nobles were humbled. The towns of Berlin and Cologne. Born to order and subjection. New mark acquired. Advantageous diplomatic relations with Mecklenburg, Saxony and Hesse. Public debt increased. Positive. Albert the Third, Achilles, son of Frederick the First. John, Sibelot, also governed in Brandenburg, highly talented as a soldier and politician. 
active, adventurous, combative, a lover of splendor and the pleasure of life. Concerning his moral character, there is a difference of opinion. He was perhaps underhanded, tortuous and self-seeking in his mighty ambitions. Much of the actual government of Brandenburg was left to his son, John Ciblo. 1470-1486 Neutral positive. A period of warfare and heavy taxation. The enemies in Brandenburg and Pomerania and Mecklenburg were humbled. Considerable dissatisfaction and disorder, but the disruptive forces were kept fairly well in check. Neutral. John Cicero. Considered an easy, comfortable and mediocre character. Well educated and a pattern of learning. Deficient in strength of purpose, but cannot be called distinctly weak. 1486-1499. Neutral. A comparatively featureless period. Treaty of Pomerania of doubtful significance. Power of cities declined. That of the nobles increased. Government tend towards centralization, tax on beer, internal order not very well maintained. Minority of Joachim I, Frederick of Anspax Regent, 1499-1502. Brief period. Nothing of importance. Neutral or positive. Joachim I. A man of remarkably strong will, narrow-minded, tachyderm, not gifted with showy qualities, but succeeded in pursuing a shrewd and definite policy, noted for his learning which was of a pedantic nature. 1502-1535, positive. The most notable event was the introduction of Roman law. Its value to the country is debatable. Both the nobles and the cities were held in stern subjection, diplomatic position strong, to an order very well maintained. Neutral, Joachim II of mediocre ability, and no very firm views or convictions, not gifted as a soldier or administrator, but, but withal a very clever politician, a lover of pleasure, pomp, and lavish expenditure, took a cultural interest in the fine arts, not a man of bad intentions. 1535-1571, neutral. Reformation spread quietly and was officially recognized in 1539. Power of the estates increased. Bad financial management left the country in debt. Baseful relations with empire and small card league, political treaties were wise. Neutral or positive, John George. A contrast to his father, extremely vigorous and energetic, an able administrator, not inclined to warfare, harsh, tyrannical, perhaps unjust, similar to Mastini's tastes, since means generally interested in the welfare of his country. 1571-1598, positive. Finances at first greatly strengthened, afterwards somewhat declined. Country advanced in general prosperity. Manufactures and trade increased. Much desirable immigration of Protestant refugees from France, and especially from the Netherlands. Peace and neutrality maintained. Renewed understanding with Pomerania over the question of the succession. The actual diplomatic position became isolated and not strong. Many new public buildings and fortifications. Neutral, Joachim Frederick. Medium grade ability. Well educated and industrious. Quiet, peaceful, honest and well intended. 1598-1608, neutral. Few striking events. Establishment of a state council, Gaudium Rat, which drew power away from the estates, which had not succeeded well in preserving order. Some political events towards the ultimate control of Prusen. Neutral. John Sigismund. Not a man of marked personal character or strength of purpose, but possessed in the hand of a fair share of instinctive shrewdness, inclined to outbursts of rage alternating with complacency. A hard drinker and prone to idleness, but was probably not without patriotic intention. 1608 to 1619, neutral. Much religious commotion, and ending in the recognition of the principles of toleration. East Pomerania united to Brandenburg through marriage, otherwise not a bored and interesting period. Dispute over Julic Cleves remained unsettled. Negative, George William, Tibene Capricius, sought his own ease and comfort. Weak morally and physically, as well as mentally. 1619 and 1640, negative, very marked decline. Attempt to play a neutral part in the Thirty Years' War met with every disaster. Brandenburg crushed between Denmark and the Emperor. Prussia between Sweden and Poland. The nation brought to bankruptcy. Political dissolution and internal lawlessness. Positive, Frederick William, called the Great Elector. Rugged, vigorous, patient. One of the ablest men of his day. Prudent and careful. A strong, direct will often violent temper, a liking for strong drink, not altogether popular or nicely scrupulous, was a man of broad and essentially high ideals. 1640-1668, positive. Definite and vigorous policy at once established. 
army reorganized, disciplined, and rendered effective. Important victories of Ferbelin and Setin, the diet suppressed. Agriculture and commerce improved and encouraged. Much desirable immigration. Revenues greatly increased. Acquisition of Eastern Pomerania, Medenburg, Hotzebrat, and Minden. General political importance greatly enhanced. Negative. Frederick I. Ability below the average of kings. Vain, ostentatious, interested only in petty details. Load on the judgment of others. Humane, generous, even extravagant. 1688 to 1713, negative. Corruption in the government. Deterioration of the army. Depletion of the treasury. Excessively burdensome taxation. Foreign policy weak. Prussia gained the status of a kingdom. And some further desirable immigration took place, but in general the period was one of decline. Positive. Frederick William I. Very parsimonious, industrious, determined, and arbitrary. Not an attractive person. I was nevertheless an able administrator. Coarse, brutal, and ferocious, appears to have been devoted to duty, at least as he saw it. 1713 to 1740, positive. Country enjoyed peace and internal development. Most important were the military and financial improvements. Industrial expansion, immigration encouraged, and population increased. No great external achievements. Diplomatically, Prussia became isolated. Positive. Ferric II the Great. Broad and comprehensive genius. Great firmness of will. Insatial ambition and love of power. An indefatigable worker. Cold, cynical and arbitrary, but not devoid of personal attachments. Attempted to justice and the welfare of humanity. 1740 to 1786, positive. Great progress in nearly every department. 70 million thalers in the treasury at the close of the reign. Army raised to 200,000 well-disciplined troops. Agriculture improved. Colonies of immigrants established. All kinds of manufacturers flourished, especially silk. Prussia became for the first time recognized as a power in Europe. At least 100,000 foreigners came to Prussia and altogether the population increased enormously. It is not pretend, however, that Frederick's rule made his subjects happy. Bibliography for Austria A. Allgemein der Biographie, 52 volumes, Leipzig, 1875, 1906. B. Encyclopedia Britannica, 9th and 11th editions. C. Word is back. Biographies, Lexicon, 60 volumes, Wien, 1856-91. D. Brockhaus. Conversations, Lexicons, 2 volumes, Leipzig, 1906. E. La Grande Encyclopédie, 31 volumes, Paris, 1811-62. A. Cox, W. House of Austria, 3 volumes, 1847. A.A., 5 volumes, London, 1820. B. Liger Lewis, P.M. A History of Austria-Hungary from the Earliest Times to the Year 1889. Translated from the French by Mrs. Birkbeck Hill. Prefaced by E.A. E. Freeman. London, 1889. C. Huber Elfens. Geschichte Osterix. 5 volumes. Gotha, 1885-96. D. Menzel Wolfgang. History of Germany from the Earliest Period to the Present Time. Translated from the fourth German edition by Mr. Geo Horrocks, three volumes, London, 1876-79. E. Wright, J. H. Editor. History of All Nations, 24 volumes, Philadelphia, 1905. F. Greenley Hatton. History of the Thirty Years' War. Translated by Andrew T. Brook, two volumes, New York, 1884. G. Beer, Adolf. Allgemeine Geschichte des Wilthendels. Three volumes, Wien, 1860. H. Prutz, Hans. Starting Geschichte des Eblislands im Mittelalter. Second volume, Berlin, 1897. J. Kronz, Franz, Horbock, De Geschichte. Osterix mit besonderer Russisch auf Lander. Volkerkund und Kulturgeschichte. Four volumes. 1876-79. K. Rank Leopold von. History of the Reformation, Germany. Three volumes. London, 1905. L. Mayer. Franz M. Geschisch Osterix mit besonderer Russisch auf des Kulturleben. Two volumes. Wien and Leipzig, 1900-201. M. Whitman, Sydney, Austria, New York, 1889.
ruler, positive, ruler of the first of Habsburg, emperor, physically and mentally a grand figure in the age in which he lived, noted for his practical wisdom, prudence, and sense of justice, condition of country, 1276 to 1291, positive, Austria, Styria, and Carniola, acquired through force of arms by Rudolf of Habsburg, who had already been elected emperor. The most important fact is that order and tranquility were restored. Positive. Albert I. Able, energetic, brave, firm, excessively ambitious, was a vericious, capricious, and extremely cruel, but is credited with an austere frankness and with domestic virtue. 1283 to 1308. Positive. Internal order vigorously maintained. Tyranny was felt chiefly by the nobles. Robber barons were suppressed. Burghers, the suburban class, and serfs were catered to and received benefits. Most of the interest centers around events outside of Austria and the efforts of Albert to strengthen the then disorganized empire. Frederick and Leopold. Neutral. Frederick the Handsome. Mediocre ability, brave, amiable, and not deficient in accomplishments. Mild, benevolent, and honorable. Neutral, Leopold. Bold, hardy, energetic. Possessed considerable talent for warfare, but was a restless, turbulent spirit, lacking in judgment. He seems to have fallen into a state of melancholia after the Battle of Murdolph, 1322, and died 1326, in a fit of frenzy. 1308 to 1330, a period of warfare with the Swiss, but variants not characterized by success or by important results in any direction. On the whole, the Austrians appear to have been the losers. The territorial gains were the country of Ret of Ferret, 1324, and the domains of Kyberg, 1326. In 1315, the forest towns threw off the Austrian yoke. Positive. Albert and Otto. Albert the Wise. A distinctly superior ruler, high talents as a soldier and administrator, learned, benignant, humane, extremely popular with his subjects. Otto the Gay. An obscure character, but little mentioned. Died February 16, 1339. Aged 37. 1330 to 1359. Positive. Increase in territory and external strength. Territorial gains. Brisach, Schaffensen, Reinfelden, Neuburg, Rappenschwell, and the Duchy of Carinthia. Losses. Lucerne, Glarus, and Zug. Vienna and Klagenfurt. The capital of Carinthia received new municipal codes. Suppression of trial by combat in Carinthia. Positive. Rudolf IV. This prince was called by four different surnames. The Silent, the Magnificent, the Learned, and the Founder. Each one, says Kroner, characterized one of his qualities. He is generally credited with high and precocious talents and a knowledge of the arts and sciences. Certainly in advance of his times. He was secretive in his plans and perhaps underhanded in his methods is believed to have falsified charters to further the independence of the empire. Died aged 25. 1359 to 1365, positive. Brief but important reign. Austria proper gained the large territory known as the Tyrol and became more independent of the empire. Internal administration was vigorous. Trade and manufacturers were encouraged. Tax imposed on wine and beer. University of Vienna and Cathedral St. Stephen founded. Albert and Leopold. Neutral. Albert III, placid and peaceful disposition, a slow, serious person, dot deficient in firmness nor understanding, attached to the pursuit of literature and the exact sciences, popular with his subjects. Neutral, Leopold, brave, ambitious, impetuous, devoted to warfare, but his plans are not well thought out. His character described as rapacious. 1365 to 1395, neutral positive. A period of external wars of doubtful outcome, Internal conditions in Austria are peaceful. Considerable waste of resources. Gains in territory, 1367. Briscow, 1374. The property of the Counts of Gorica in Carniola, 1379. The Ballywick of Sorbia, 1381. Hohenberg, 1382. Trist. From 1379 to 1386, territories of the House of Habsburg were divided between Albert and Leopold. Austria alone fought to Albert. Neutral. Albert IV and William Albert IV. A rather vague and doubtfully outlined character, was called by some the patient, had a reputation for piety and devotion to religion and occult sciences, always wanted to talk a dangerous pilgrimage to Palestine, which gave him much dramatic admiration. Died in 1404. William de Frandlich, 
an obscure person, said to have been popular and to have had knightly qualities, died in 1406. 1395 to 1405, neutral. A brief and unimportant period. Dissensions among Hasburg branches, Styria, Corinthia, and Carniola, administered by William, who claimed also Austria. An agreement was reached that both should rule jointly, 1404. Some parliamentary events, distant. Minority of Albert V, Leopold IV, and Ernest Regents. Neutral, Leopold. Of no great ability and little virtue, quarrelsome and self-seeking, outwardly polished, and a patron of learning, his character has as been unduly slandered. Positive. Ernest de Ezern, younger brother of Leopold IV. Strong, positive, able, and excessively ambitious, and covetous. 1406 to 1411, negative. A period of discord. Lawless nobles and banditti devastated the country. Sometimes the power of Leopold was predominant, sometimes that of Ernest, and the aim of both was to enrich themselves by exactions and impositions before the young Albert could assume the reins of government. Positive. Albert V, Emperor, 1438. Able administrator, a firm, serious, dignified, lofty type of man. Simple in his tastes. Tacit in nature. Magnanimous, highly esteemed. 1411 to 1439, positive. Change in tranquility and prosperity. Security for life and property. Turks driven from Hungary. 1435. Bohemian Hungary came to the Habsburgs through marriage of Albert V with Elizabeth, highest of these countries. Native. Minority of letters laws. Posthumous. Control the government divided. Letters laws was a weak youth and died at 17. 1439 to 1457. Neutral. Austria, Hungary, and Bohemia may theoretically be considered as united in this reign, under a single crown worn by the youthful Ladislaus. Practically, there was no union. Various parties and factions were at war with each other. The period went without glory from the important victories gained by Hanyadi and Ladislaus of Poland against the Turks. Frederick III, Emperor, and his younger brother Albert. In 1458, Albert was granted Upper Austria, Frederick Lower Austria. Vienna was to be the joint residence. Neutral, Frederick III. Slow, persistent, phlegmatic, lacked energy, his disposition peaceful, sedentary in his tastes, a lover of learning, stubborn, selfish, his private life was chaste and abstemious, consistently devoted to the aggrandizement of his family. Neutral, Albert. Ardent, impetuous, restless, rash, gay, excessively ambitious, prodigal, fond of war. 1457-1463, negative. On the death of Ladislaus, Hungary and Bohemia separated from Austria. This period was occupied by party warfare between the brothers Frederick and Albert. Neutral. Frederick III, Emperor. See above. 1463 to 1493. Neutral. The Turks several times evaded Corniola and Styria. In 1485, the Austrians were defeated by Matthias Corvinus, King of Hungary, who made Vienna his capital. House of Austria aggrandized its power by the marriage of Maximilian with Mary, Iris of Burgundy. Though often considered a weak and unfortunate reign, there is a good deal to be said on the favourable side. Austrian political influence was considerably augmented. Something was accomplished towards suppressing lawlessness and furthering justice. Sorbian League benefited Austria. Taxation was especially burdensome, considerable building. Positive. Maximilian I. Vain and versatile. Call the last of the knights, brilliant, eloquent, learned, ambitious, and hard worker, but too impulsive and erratic. He was some charge of duplicity. He was amiable and popular, a picturesque figure, one of the best remembered of the Habsburgs. 1493 to 1519, positive or neutral. Austria enlarged and consolidated. Establishment of law and order. Reforms and improvements in the internal administration, in the army, navy, and police regulations. Foreign diplomacy weak. Finances decline, taxation high. Positive. Charles V. Sergius, vigorous, inordinately ambitious, much duplicity in his character. Selfish, cold, his virtues negative rather than positive. References see Spain, 1519 and 1521. Neutral. Brief period, no important changes. Positive. Ferdinand I. Well educated and very industrious, though not endowed with brilliant talents. It's generally considered a superior ruler. Amiable, frank, just, sober, and pure in his domestic life. Inclined towards peace and a moderate policy. 1521 to 1564. Neutral. Period of the Reformation. Uprisings in Tyrol, Hungary, and Bohemia, which were suppressed. 
Civil wars in Transylvania, which country was lost? France is declined. Positions extended by several important districts. Army strengthened and conditions of the peasantry improved. Industry grew. Positive. Maximilian II, wise and prudent, talented, liberal, and amiable. A model husband and father, an excellent character in many ways, but was perhaps lacking in firmness. 1564 to 1576, positive. Period of peace, law, strength, order, and justice. Austria not successful in the question of Poland. Cities were very flourishing, lower classes prosperous. Rudolf II, in youth he invinced good capacity and considerable learning. Mild, indolent, and pleasure-loving, increasing melancholia, and a penchant for drink terminated in mental weakness during the last 14 years of his life. Resigned his crown. 1576-1611, negative. Many civil and religious uprisings, internal confusion, weakness and corruption in the government, agrarian difficulties, and peasants' war. Negative. Matthias. In his youth, active, restless, and ambitious, no great ability, Unreliable and intriguing. During his latter years, which comprised the period of his reign, he showed little interest in affairs of state. 1612 to 1619. Neutral. Unsettled conditions continued. Civil and religious troubles. Humiliating peace of Turkey. 1615. Treasury depleted. Neutral. Ferdinand II. Diligent and well meaning but narrow minded. Patient and devout but tyrannical and bigoted. Perhaps cruel. Private life praiseworthy. Extravagant in the use of money. 1619 to 1637, negative or neutral. Part of the Thirty Years' War period. Various foreign wars. No marked progress in the material side. Much building religious edifices. Finance is depleted. Many intelligent subjects immigrated. Loss of personal liberty. Neutral. Ferdinand III. Of mediocre ability. Learned and fond of the arts. But lacking in strength and decision of character. Mild, frugal and extremely just. 1637 to 1657, neutral. Establishment of internal peace, constitutional progress, frugal financial management, decline in international prestige, loss of Alsace, considerable depopulation. Neutral, Leopold I, a learned recluse, diligent in application to details, but lacking in depth and decision, private and domestic virtues praiseworthy, well many extremely charitable. 1657-1705, positive. By the Peace of Karlowitz, Austria acquired Turkish Hungary, Slavonia, and Transylvania. Improvements in the administration of justice and in the army. Financial depletion. Some decline in trade. Positive. Joseph I. Clear, active, and vigorous intellect. Amiable, generous, tolerant, and humane. Tastes artistic and scientific. 1705 to 1711. Positive. Brief reign. Wars of Spanish succession was on. Empire showed strength in its inner and outer activities. Negative. Charles VI. Stupid and obstinate. A poor ruler, deficient in intellectual grasp. Cold, jealous, suspicious, unreliable, though probably well-intentioned. Pierce, fond of the fine arts. 1711-1740. Negative. Peace of Basaritz. 1718. Broad increase of territory, which, however, was of doubtful advantage. Events of 1733-1739, to unfortunate of Austria. By the Peace of Belgrade, much territory given back to the Turks. Finances and a condition of the army reduced to a deplorable state. Weak diplomacy. Some increase in trade and industry. At the close of this reign, Austria had sunk to a point of extreme weakness. Positive. Mary Theresa. Brave, amiable, very industrious, economical. Kind, charitable, a good wife and mother. Strict, even a little in her prejudices. 1740 to 1780. Positive. The various portions of the kingdom unified and centralized. Austria gained slightly in territory and greatly in prestige. Industry, commerce, and agriculture improved. Neutral. Joseph II. A very strange character. Restless, brave, ambitious, mentally alert, and well-informed, but was impractical and visionary. An incompetent general. Benevolent, generous, and anxious to bring about reforms. Austria but amiable. Praise for his domestic virtues. His chief vice was duplicity. 1780-1790. to Neutral. Neither progress nor decline is clearly marked. A period of internal agitation in foreign wars. The reforms were too drastic to meet with success. Some improvement in agriculture, roads and canals. Some dearly brought success against Turks. The diplomatic position of Austria was weakened to the advantage of Prussia. Positive, Leopold II, a clever, cautious politician, intelligent and energetic, kind-hearted and just. 
is said to have been a libertine. 1790-1792, neutral. Brief period. Opinions vary as to its significance. Restoration of law and order by conciliations. Perhaps a weakened diplomatic position. Private liberty is somewhat curtailed. Bibliography for Turkey. A. Encyclopedia Britannica, 9th and 11th editions. A. Creasy, Sir Edward. History of the Ottoman Turks. London, 1877. B. Freeman, E.A. The Ottoman Power in Europe, London, 1877. C. Von Hammer Pogstal, J. Geschichte des Osmanischen Reiches. Four volumes. Budapest, 1834-35. D. The Cambridge Modern History, edited by A. W. Ward, G. W. Prothero, Stanley Leiths, planned by the late Lord Acton. 13 volumes, Cambridge, England, 1902-11. E. Sinkazen, J. W. Geschichte des Osmanischen Reiches in Europa. 7 volumes, Hamburg and Gotha, 1840-63. F. La Jonquière A. Histoire de l'Empire Ottoman, Paris, 1881. G. Landpool Stanley, The Story of Turkey, London, New York, 1900. H. Jorga N. Geschichte des Osmanischen Reiches, 2 volumes, Gotha, 1908-09. Positive. Osman, Othman I. Brave, resolute, subdual, an able warrior, and popular leader. Highly eulogized for mildness, humanity and justice, although he's reported to have murdered his uncle. 1288 to 1326. Positive. Foundation of the Ottoman power. Dominion and large. Partially at the expanse of rival chieftains, but principally from the Greek Empire. Positive. Orkan. Orkan. Great organizer. Superior military and political talents. A brave warrior and upright prince. Free from cruelty. 1325 to 1359, positive. Extensive conquest from the Greeks in Asia Minor. Army of Janissaries founded. Also many mosques, colleges and other public institutions. Positive. Murad, Amarath I, able warrior and politician. In the main upright, though cruel at times. 1359 to 1389, positive. Prosperity and victories. Conquest of Romelia and Bulgaria. Positive. Bayezid, Bajazet I, the Thunderbolt. An able general distinguished for his rapidity of his movements. Cold, cruel, licentious, and a drunkard. 1389 to 1402, positive. Conquest of the greater part of Asia Minor and a considerable portion of Greece. Victory of allied Christians at Nicopolis. Defeated by Tamerlane at Angora. Negative. Interregnum. 1402 to 1413, negative. Kingdom weakened in the struggle of rival princes. Positive. Muhammad. Muhammad I. Accomplished just and magnanimous, a patron of literature and poetry. 1413-1421, positive. Turkish dominion again consolidated and restored. The European power of the Ottomans made but small advance. Considerable building of mosques, etc. Positive or neutral, Murad, Amaraf II. An able, just and humane ruler. His character was as noble as it was commanding. 1421-1451, positive. Turkish power advanced. Thessalonia added. In the wars with Hunyadi, victories balanced defeats. Positive, Mahmoud II the Conqueror. Not only a great soldier and statesman and organizer, but a master of many languages, was notorious for his cruelty, lust and faithlessness. 1451 to 1481, positive. Marked advance. Famous capture of Constantinople. Serbia and Bosnia reduced also. Trebizond, Karaman, the Crimea and many lands of the Greek archipelago were added to the Turkish dominion. Much building of schools, mosques, etc. Neutral. Bayezid. Bajazet, the second. Unambitious and peace-loving. Simple his habits. Austere in his devotions. Fond of speculative philosophy. His virtues were much praised. Deposed by his son, Selim. 1481-1512. Neutral. A general lethargy. Practically no advance against the Christians. Many internal disturbances, no special decline. A single naval victory. Apparently no lack of finances, more building. Positive. Selim I. A warrior of high ability. Remarkable his political, sagacity and literary talent. Extremely cruel and bloodthirsty, cared little for pleasure. 1512-1520. to 1520, Positive. 
Empire doubled in extent. Conquests of Kurdistan, Syria and Egypt. Increase in the navy. Positive. Suleiman I, the Magnificent. One of the ablest rulers of his time. Brilliant genius in war and government. Extremely just. Free from vices. Warm-hearted and sincere. He is, however, accused of undue severity in ordering the execution of many of his officers and relations. 1520-1566. Positive. Turkish Empire attained the summit of its power and glory. Conquest of Hungary. Transylvania, Rhodes, and a large portion of Armenia. Much building of mosques, bridges, and roads. Negative. Selim II. Weak in intellect, extremely degraded, idle, sensuous, addicted to drunkenness, and the causes vices. Cruel and treacherous. 1556 to 1574. Neutral. Neither advanced nor decline clearly marked. Cyprus and Tunis were won. The Turks met an overwhelming defeat in the famous naval battle of Lepanto. Negative. Murad. Amrath III. Weak and sensual as well as cruel, but his mind was not altogether without cultivation. He ruled in name only. 1574 to 1595. Negative. Rapid decay. Insubordination in the army. Transylvania, Moldavia, and Wallachia rose in revolt. Negative. Muhammad III. Feeble ruler, devoted to pleasure, weak-minded, jealous, sickly, voluptuary, put his nineteen brothers to death. 1595 to 1603, negative. Inglorious reign, decline, unsuccessful war in Persia, revolts in the army, a victory over the Austrians and Transylvanians, but nothing came of it. Negative. Ahmed I. Irresolute, weak, selfish, indolent, though moderate and good-natured, too much love of pleasure. 1603 to 1617, negative. Further loss of national prestige. Negative. Osman. Osman II. A bold, ambitious youth with little political wisdom or military skill. Very cruel and hard-hearted, but not sensual. 1618 to 1622, negative. Loss of territory which was restored to Persia. Revolt of the Janissaries and murder of Osman. Negative. Mustafa I. An imbecile. 1622 to 1623, negative. Miseries, disorders, intrigues, robberies, and murders. Positive. Murad. Amrath the Fourth. Courageous, vigorous, decisive, passionate, tyrannical, cruel, and drunkard. 1623-1640. Positive. Order and discipline re-established. Turkey again restored to something of its former glory. Revenues were honestly administered. Bad debt retaken from the Persians. Reforms in the army. Negative. Ibrahim. Weak and sensuous voluptuary. Cowardly, selfish, cruel, brutal. 1640-1648, negative. All the evils that had been incurred for a time broke out afresh. Treasury depleted. Taxes increased. Negative. Minority of Muhammad IV. Caprilli, Grand Wazir, 1656-1661. Followed by his son, Fazil. Both were men of great ability. 1648-1663, positive. Disorders and evils until 1656, when Caprilli came to control, of this progress and prosperity order established. Tenidus Limnos taken from the Venetians. Negative. Mahabha IV. Weak, selfish, not especially cruel, devoted to hunting, had some literary tastes, lazy, good-natured, just and clement. 1663-1687. Neutral. Island of Candia captured by the Turks under the leadership of Fazil Ahmed, but after his death in 1676, disaster followed, disaster in many cities were lost, naval power declined. Negative. Silly man the second. Dull though well-meaning, devoted himself to petty details and reorganizing the army, not idle or sensual. Pious, credulous. 1687-1691, negative. Mutiny and pillage by the Janissaries. Turks lost a great part of Hungary but recovered Serbia and Belgrade. Negative. Amen the second. Feeble, melancholy, and pious. Had little influence. Mild, well-meaning, fond of literature. 1691 to 1695. Negative. Defeats, domestic insurrection, pestilence. Negative. Mustafa the second. Naturally intelligent and cultivated. Started with firmness and good intentions. Not a strong character. In his outer life sank into ease and sensuality, was deposed. 1695 to 1703, negative. First part of the reign successful against the Austrians, last part disastrous. Further defeats, loss of territory and international prestige. Peace of Karlowitz, 
1609, marked the final decline of the Ottoman power. Neutral and negative, Ahmed III, mediocre, peaceful character, lover of ease and luxury, ruled by his grand viziers. 1703 to 1730, neutral, success against Peter the Great at the Pruth, recovery of Azov and Moria, balanced loss of territory in the disastrous war of Austria, internal conditions were fairly prosperous. Negative. Mohammed I. Little intellect, no influence, mild in disposition, quiet in his tastes, humane and affable. 1730 to 1754, positive. A fairly prosperous reign, success against the Austrians. Belgrade, Osova, with the portions of Serbia, Bosnia and Wallachia, restored to Turkey. Increased international prestige. Negative. Osman, Othman III. Inferior ability, changeable, passionate, left the direction of affairs to others. 1754 to 1757, negative. Brief reign, no important changes. Negative. Mustafa III. Mediocre ability and much industry. Well-intentioned, but hasty and headstrong, devout, austere. 1757 to 1773, negative. First part of the reign filled with reforms and not unprosperous. Last part disastrous. Russians took Crimea, Moldavia, Wallachia in 1770. Negative. Abu Ulhamid. Weak and insignificant ruler. Left the direction of affairs to his vizier. 1773 to 1789. Negative. Humiliating peace of Kainarji in 1774. In last part of the reign, Turkey suffered further defeats by the Russians and Austrians. End of Appendix 1, Part 2, and End of Section 21. Section 22 of The Influence of Monarchs by Frederick Adams Woods. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Appendix 1, Part 3. Bibliography for Scotland A. Dictionary of National Biography, 66 Volumes, London, 1885-1901 B. Encyclopedia Britannica, 9th and 11th Editions A. Burton, John H. History of Scotland, New Edition Revised, 9 Volumes Index Edinburgh, London, 1873 B. Macintosh, John The History of Civilization in Scotland, New Edition, 3 Volumes, 1892-95 C. Brown, P. Hume, History of Scotland, three volumes, Cambridge, eighteen ninety nine to nineteen oh nine. D. Lang, Andrew, History of Scotland from the Roman Occupation, four volumes, Edinburgh and London, nineteen hundred to oh seven. Positive, Robert Bruce, able warrior and administrator, brave, popular, liberal, and pious, thirteen oh six to thirteen twenty nine. Positive. Many wars in which the country was exhausted, but victories far outnumbered the defeats. Scotland was consolidated and free from English rule. Many wise laws were enacted relative to the administration of justice and organization of the army. Negative. Minority of David II. Randolph, Earl of Moray, Regent. 1329 to 1332. Positive. Vigorous and successful government. Negative. Minority of David II. Donald, Earl of Mar, nephew of King Robert. Bruce, Regent. Weak and incapable. July 1332, August 1332, negative. Disasters. Negative. Minority of David II, Sir Archibald Douglas, and afterwards Sir Andrew Moray, Regents. 1332 to 1338, negative. Scots defeated by the English. Neutral. Minority of David II, Robert Stuart, afterwards Robert II, Regent. At this time young and active. 1338-1341, positive. Strongholds of Perth, Stirling, and Edinburgh were won back. Negative. David II. Incapable, headstrong, extravagant, passionate, devoted to pleasure. 1342-1371, negative. Scots defeated. English overran the southern part of Scotland, which was obliged to pay a large ransom to England. Deplorable state of internal disorder. Turbulence among the nobles. Impoverishment of the country. Some parliamentary advance. Neutral. Robert II, House of Stuart. A man of judgment and fair ability, but at that time his life in poor health, indolent and peace-loving. Simple and affable in his manners. No much is known about his private life, had many illegitimate children. 1371-1390. to 
Rather uneventful and vague conditions, Scots were victorious over the English at Otterbourne, 1388. Social progress of the nation was much retarded. Minor border raids, but the general result was a gradual recovery of Scottish territory. Negative, Robert III. Of less intellect and even more indolent than Robert II, his father, otherwise much like him. 1390 to 1402, negative. Decline. Scots suffered several defeats. English harried over the border. Lawlessness among the nobles. Miseries among the people. Parliament enacted some good laws. Positive. Minority of James I, Robert, Duke of Albany, son of Robert II, regent. A man of energy and ability. 1402 to 1420, positive. Important victory for the government of our law. Better establishment of order. Negative. Minority of James I. Murdoch, son of Albany, regent. Weak, lazy, incompetent. 1420 to 1424, distinct decline. Positive. James I. Fearless, active, accomplished. An able administrator and organiser. Literary tastes. A lover of peace and justice. 1424 to 1437, positive. Prosperous and comparatively peaceful reign. Subjugation of the Highlands. Many legal reforms related to private warfare. Justice, commerce, coinage, etc. Many parliaments. Negative. Minority of James II. Regency divided. Archibald and then William, Earls of Douglas, were only nominally regents. Crichton and Livingstone alternately had the custody of the young king. 1437-1451. Negative. A period of private wars. James II, accidentally killed in his thirtieth year, considered promising young man, energetic and impulsive. 1451-1460. Neutral. Civil wars and border raids, good progress in legislation relative to agriculture, coinage, and the administration of justice. Positive. Minority of James III, Kennedy, grandson of Robert III, chief regent, wise, moderate, and upright. 1460-1466, positive. Comparatively peaceful and orderly, Lord of the Isles defeated. Negative. Minority of James III, Regency divided. 1466-1474, negative. Plots of conspiracies among nobles, decline in the administration of justice. Negative. James III, lacked bravery and energy, of rather inferior capacity, the lover of literature and the fine arts. Charged with a propensity for low company. 1474-1488, Negative. A period of lawlessness. Conspiracies of the malcontents. Defeat and murder of the king. Loss of Berwick to the English. Debasement of the coinage. Neutral. James IV. Ambitious and brave, but rash and chaotic. Not adept in diplomacy or generalship. Truthful, liberal, and popular, but licentious. 1488 to 1513. Neutral. Establishment of law and order. Beginnings of naval power. Increase in international importance and commerce. Disastrous defeat at Flodden, in which the flower of Scottish chivalry perished. Financial exhaustion. Neutral. Minority of James IV. John Stuart, Duke of Albany, cousin of James V, regent part of the time. Difficult to estimate. One finds differing views about him. Enterprise and able as a negotiator, though a poor general. Lavish and extravagant. 1513. Negative. Turmoil and internal contest. Murders in the following period. Negative. Minority of James V. Regency divided part of the time. 1528. Negative. Unsettled conditions continued. Positive. James V. Ambitious, vigorous, with more than average ability, popular with the lower classes, irregular in his manner of life. 1528-1542. Positive. Successful reign with the exception of the Scotch defeat at Solway. Renewed order and prosperity. Negative. Minority of Mary. James Hamilton. Earl of Aran. Regent. Weak. Easy. Fickle. 1542-1554. Negative. The country suffered greatly by the English raids. Positive. Minority of Mary. Mary of Lorraine. Regent. A strong, able character. 1554-1550. Neutral. Events of the Reformation. No marked progress or decline in political or material matters. Positive or neutral, Mary Queen of Scots. Brilliant and emotional, not particularly wise politically, passionate, revengeful, and unpatriotic. 1550 to 1567, negative or neutral. Conditions similar to the foregoing period.
Positive. Minori of James VI. Murray, Regent. A man of energy and firmness, this character has been estimated very differently according to the temper or prejudice of those who have judged him. 1557 to 1570, negative. Order restored and justice administered. Then famine and pestilence. English invasion and civil war. Neutral. Minori of James VI. Matthew Stewart, Earl of Lennox, Regent. Intellectual mediocrity and lack of personal stamina. 1570 to 1571, negative. Plots and counterplots, intrigues and seizures. Neutral, Minority of James VI, Earl of Mar, Regent. Not distinguished, honest and faithful. 1571 to 1572, negative. Civil wars and turmoil. Negative, Minority of James VI, Earl of Morton, Regent. Non-royal. 1572 to 1580, positive. Peace and order re-established. Negative. Minority of James VI. Regency divided. 1580-1587. Negative. Disorder. Raid of Ruthven. Neutral. James VI. First of England. Shrewd but vain. Foolish and weak. Learned but pedantic and trivial. Pompous and arbitrary. Not the coward he has sometimes painted. 1587-1625. Positive. Diminution of disorder. Some increase in general prosperity, introduction of new industries, glass, soap and leather, and development of woolen manufacture, loss of political liberty. Bibliography for England A. Dictionary of National Biography, 66 Volumes, London, 1885-1901 B. Encyclopedia Britannica, 9th and 11th editions A. Green, J.R. A Short History of the English People, 4 Volumes, London, 1894, New York, 1893. B. Freeman, E.A. History of the Norman Conquest, 6 volumes, Oxford, 1871. C. Stubbs, William. The Early Plantagenets, New York, 1876. Epochs and Modern History. D. Gardiner, S.I. The History of England from the Ascension of James I, 10 volumes, London, 1893-99. E. Rogers, J. E. Thorold. The History of Agriculture and Princes in England, 7 Volumes, Oxford, 1896-1902. F. Cunningham, W. The Growth of English Industry and Commerce During the Early Middle Ages, Cambridge, 1890. G. Cheney, E. P. Introduction to the Industrial and Social History of England, New York, 1901. H. Thrale, H. D. Editor. Social England, A Record of the Progress of the People, by 19 Specialists, 6 Volumes, London, 1893-97. J. Stubbs, W. The Constitutional History of England, in its Origin and Development, 3 Volumes, Oxford, 1874-78. K. Freeman, E. A. The Reign of William Rufus and the Accession of Henry I, 2 Volumes, Oxford, 1882. L. Gibbons, H. D. B. Commerce in Europe, London, 1891. M. Yeats, J. The Growth and Vicissitudes of Commerce, London, 1872. N. Woodward, W. H. Expansion of the British Empire, Cambridge, 1899. O. The Cambridge and Modern History, edited by A. W. Ward, G. W. Prothero, Stanley, Leiths, planned by the late Lord Acton, 13 volumes, Cambridge, England, 1902-11. P. Ramsey, Sir J. H. The Angevin Empire, London, 1903. Q. Willie, J. H. History of England under Henry IV, four volumes, London, 1884-98. R. Ramsey, Sir J. H. The Foundations of England, two volumes, London, 1898. S. Hunt, W. Poole, R. L. Editors. The Political History of England, twelve volumes, London, 1907. T. Norgate Kate. England under and given kings. Two volumes. London, 1887. U. Davis. H.W.C. England of the Normans and Angevins. London, 1905. Ruler. Positive. William I. The Conqueror. Remarkable genius and iron will. An unscrupulous and somewhat cruel tyrant. Good husband and father. Condition of country. 1066 to 1087. Positive. England unified. 
marked advance in law and order, although the people were oppressed. Positive or neutral, William II, Rufus, brave and able soldier, crafty statesman, clever but unsustained, a violent ruffian, extremely tyrannical and perfidious, especially debased in his private life, both avaricious and extravagant. 1087 to 1100, neutral. Congress in Normandy and Maine, extension of the power of England on the Welsh marches, soon on the northwestern frontier. But the heavy cost of the wars brought the people to a state of extreme wretchedness. Taxation was especially oppressive. Neutral. Henry I. Beale Clerk. Of marked ability and self-control, a good soldier and a great administrator. Energetic, industrious, learned, eloquent, and judicious. Gold, crafty, cruel, and dissembling. Temperate, he was, however, licentious. 1100 to 1135. Positive. The taxes were heavy but the general picture of this reign is distinctly bright. Peace and security in the land, and relatively active trade. The country gained in prestige through the French wars, charter of liberties. Many towns also received charters. Negative, Stephen. Brave, active and well-meaning, but incapable. A mild man, soft and good, and in no justice, frank and generous. 1135 to 1154, negative. A period of anarchy and suffering, Invasion by the Scots and loss of territory on the border. Positive. Henry II. Rough, sensuous, vigorous, industrious and learned. Temper violent. A great lawgiver. Led an extremely active life. And a wonderful memory. His worst characteristic was his tricky dishonesty. He was certainly popular with all classes of the people. 1154 to 1189. Positive. Re-establishment of law and order. Marked advance in jurisprudence. Reforms in the currency. England's power rose. Active building. Positive or neutral, Richard I. Brave and brilliant warrior. Possessed many accomplishments. Frank, generous and sincere. He was also passionate. Impetuous, licentious and haughty. But not essentially cruel. 1189 to 1199, positive. Constitutional progress on the lines of the former reign. The country suffered from excessive taxation resulting from the Crusades and the King's Ransom. Positive. John. Not lacking cleverness and spasmodic energy, but devoid of judgment and breadth of insight. Utterly depraved, mean, vindictive, licentious, cruel and false. 1199-1216. Neutral. Turbulence and disorder resulting in the Magna Carta. The rights of individuals are fight and enhance. This constitutional growth must be regarded as of great importance. Negative. Regency. William Marshall, Earl of Pembroke. 1216-1219, positive. Order established. Negative. Regency, divided. Herbert de Burr. Pandolf. Pedro de Roches. Stephen Langton. 1219 1227, positive. Further restoration of order. French influence is expelled. Negative. Henry III. Feeble administrator. Vain, reckless, extravagant, obstinate, and undependable. Sexually moral, and not in the least cruel. 1227 to 1272, neutral. A period of trouble and suffering. In contrast, we find the beginnings of a parliament and germs of constitutionalism. The crown became impoverished, but the wealth of the nation was, as a whole, increased. There was much building on a large scale. Positive, Edward I. Stern, able, laborious, and conscientious. Practical administrator, chaste and temperate. True to his word, arrogant, vindictive, and perhaps cruel. 1272-1307, positive. General prosperity and marked economic advance. Judicial reforms. Conquest of Wales and Scotland. Depletion of treasury. Negative. Edward II. Cowardly, incapable, dissolute, a hard drinker, not tyrannical, weak, indolent and faithless. 1307-1327, negative. Misery and national decline. Loss of Scotland. Negative. Regency divided. Queen Isabella, Mortimer, and several others. 1327 to 1330. Negative. War with Scotland unsuccessful and shameful peace of 1328. Positive. Edward III. Extremely enterprising and adventurous, brave, active, and able, though not a great organizer. Selfish, ambitious, ostentatious, and licentious. 1330 to 1377. Positive. Restoration of order. 
important constitutional and social advance, extension of international importance and growth of commerce. However, a reign of hardships and poverty for the people, black death. Negative. Regency in a council. 1377-1389. Negative. Political and social discontent. Present risings under what Turler and others. War with France, characterised for the most part by disasters. Neutral and negative Richard II. A strange character, full of contradictions. Good natural ability and occasional firmness of will, but was impetuous, revengeful, foolish, extravagant, arbitrary, and extremely fitful. 1389 to 1399, negative or neutral. Court factions and petty civil warfare. Misery and discontent continued. Power of House of Commons increased. Neutral. Henry the Fourth, extremely energetic, also brave, prudent, accomplished, and sagacious, devout, temperate, and chaste, perhaps upon occasions cruel, but on the other hand, often showed clemency. 1399 to 1413, neutral. The general poverty of the previous reign continued, internal troubles and civil wars. The nation gained ground in political power and prestige, increased influence of the commons. Positive, Henry V, brilliant commander and statesman, Pure in life, temperate, liberal, merciful, and honourable. 1413 and 1422, neutral. Conquests in French territory. England's glory greatly enhanced and diplomatic position strong. Internal order was maintained, but the country was much drained on account of the French war. Negative. Regency. Humphrey of Gloucester. Fourth son of Henry IV held the title of protector, but the real government was equally shared by the council. The Duke of Bedford, third son of Henry IV, also played an important role as leader in France and as regent. 1422 to 1440. Negative. Loss of French territory. Decline in England's political prestige. The general state of things had never been less oval. Parliamentary franchise became narrowed by a statute of 1429. Negative. Henry VI. Extremely weak with periods of insanity. He was merciful, pious, domestic. And literary tastes. 1440-1461. Negative. 1440. End of Gloucester's Regency. 1442. Majority of Henry VI. Further loss of French territory. Country impoverished and exhausted. Anarchy prevailed. Cade's Rebellion. Neutral or positive. Edward IV. Brave, vigorous, eloquent, vicious, cruel, sensuous, and extravagant. An able general and diplomat. Who was spasmodic in his activities. Affable in his manners and popular in spite of his vices and autocratic rule. 1461-1483. Neutral. Civil and agricultural wars and violence. Commercial advance and the beginnings of manufacture. Much building of churches and manor houses. The wars of the roses did not much affect the general prosperity. Legislation and taxation were poorly administered. Power of parliament declined. Neutral or positive. Richard III. Regent and King. Brave, ambitious, cunning, and clear-sighted. Probably cruel and unscrupulous, though not the monster commonly pictured. There is simply little known about Richard III. 1483 to 1485, neutral. Similar to the reign of Edward IV. Positive. Henry VII. Prudent, vigorous, able, despotic, and very avaricious. A patron of art, literature, and commerce. His chief fault was his practice of extortion. Details of his private life but little known. 1485-1509, positive. Gradual establishment of order. Marked growth of commerce. Constitutional retrogression began during the latter part of the reign with a decline of the power of the baronage. Execure well filled. Positive. Henry VIII. Extraordinary vigour of mind and inflexibility of will. Accomplished and versatile, but imperious, selfish, cruel and sensual. 1509-1547, positive. Greatly increased importance of England internationally. Growth of agriculture, grazing, commerce, manufacture, and navy. Greater influence over Wales and Ireland. Constitutional decline. Negative. Regency of Edward VI. Somerset and Northumberland. Protectors. 1547-1553. Negative. Decline in international prestige, depletion of the treasury, revolts and general discontent. Neutral. Mary. High spirit and courageous, and devoted to what she considered a duty in her youth, precocious and promising, but afterwards suffered from a weak constitution, and in latter days mentally unbalanced, not wantonly cruel. 1553 to 1558, negative. 
a period of persecution, England defeated and humiliated abroad. Positive, Elizabeth, extremely able, scheming, practical and brave, vain, luxurious, willful, mendacious and vindictive, patriotic and unusually popular. 1558-1603, positive, peace, prosperity, progress, political prestige, vastly increased, growth in wool manufacturers but greater growth in commerce. Neutral, James I. Shrewd but vain, pedantic and trivial, unscrupulous, pompous and arbitrary, a heavy drinker. 1603-1626, positive. Steady progress in material conditions, improvement of agriculture, colonial expansion, growth of manufacturers. European campaigns and policies not successful, foreign political prestige declined. Neutral, Charles I. Proud reserves accomplished, little political wisdom. Temperate and chaste, his chief faults were duplicity and obstinacy. 1625-1649, positive. Expansion of commerce and general material prosperity. Decline in international prestige. Public discontent. Distress during civil war. Parliament struggled for its existence. Negative. The Interregnum. The Commonwealth. 1649-1659, positive. Marked improvement in commerce, agriculture and in the navy. Negative. Charles II, affable, witty, and debonair, but had no ambition, sensual, dissipated, indolent, and extravagant. 1660-1685, positive. Important constitutional legal advance, growth of the House of Commons, increase in shipping, silk trade, and banking. Agriculture did not improve, much desirable immigration in this and subsequent reign. Foreign policy weak. Negative, James II. Industrious and perhaps well-meaning in his political aims, but lacked judgment, tact, and breadth of insight. Much courage and fair ability in youth, but this had deteriorated by the time of his ascension. A great libertine until a few years before his death, when he became a religious ascetic. 1686-1689, positive. Further development of industries, tyranny, people and parliament finally asserted themselves. 1688. Henceforth, House of Commons most important branch. Positive. William III, extraordinarily precocious, one of the greatest of diplomats, able as a statesman, as a soldier, brilliant, though less great, brave, active, resourceful, not popular, in outward coldness, covered a hidden warmth, both arbitrary and magnanimous. His aims were noble, his honour unreproached, free from vanity, domestic life not praiseworthy, see also under Netherlands. 1689-1702, positive. Development of a constitutional monarchy, Bill of Rights, international prestige again, as in the days of Cromwell. Trade and wealth increased. Negative, Anne. Dull, narrow, weak, obstinate, deeply religious, many simple virtues. 1702-1714, neutral. Successful foreign policy. Commerce continued to expand. Industries prospered. New trade established between Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and Hudson's Bay Territory. Gibraltar and Minoria acquired. Growth of the Cabinet. Negative. George I. Dull and ignorant except for a fair knowledge of military affairs, frugal, steadfast in his friendships, coarse in his tastes, vicious in his private life. 1714 and 1727. Positive. An era of peace and material progress. Silk, wooden, linen and glass industries prosperous. Negative. George II. Dull, methodical, parsimonious and martinet. Coarse and licentious in his tastes. 1727-1765, positive. 1727-1739, peace and prosperity. 1739-1760, foreign policy became more vigorous. Victorious in foreign wars. Conquest of Canada and India. Foundation of charitable industries. Neutral, George III. Had a good memory. Much tenacity of purpose and talent of a narrow sort. Unyielding, frugal, of punctilious virtue. Last part of his life he was insane. 1665 to 1667. Also Beckles Wilson, George III, as man, monarch and statesman. 1907. 1760 to 1811. Positive. Loss of the American colonies, but commerce with them was soon greater than before. Great progress in agriculture with the science of cultivation and rotation of crops, and in cattle through an improvement in breeds. In manufacturers, by inventions like the flying shuttle, jenny mule, and steam engine. 
Many canals built on waterlands reclaimed. End of Appendix 1, Part 3, and End of Section 22. Section 23 of The Influence of Monarchs by Frederick Adams Woods. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Appendix 2. Reprinted from Science NS. Volume 30. Number 777. Page 703 to 704. November 19th, 1909. A new name for a new science. The following list though noticeably brief, attempts to include all books and memoirs in which the facts of history of a personal nature have been subjected to statistical analysis by some more or less objective method. Such researchers may be made to contribute to the science of eugenics. They also stand upon the border line of the allied sciences, psychology, anthropology and sociology. Since investigations of this nature contribute to several sciences, at the same time primarily to the philosophy of history itself, it seems necessary to have some special name to designate this class of work. The word biometry, already in general use, does not meet the requirements. It fails to express the primary value of this class of research, namely elucidation of the philosophy of history for its own sake, and also fails to suggest that the work should be carried forward by the historians themselves. I propose the word histriometry, derived from the Greek historia, history, and metrosai, measure. It may be noticed that these investigations treat only of groups of individuals. I am already convinced that the indications of several researchers, which I have now underway, that the quantitative method may be successfully applied to historical events of a more general character. Bibliography of Histriometry Dicandol, Alphonse Histra de Sciences et des Savants Dubius du Ciseles, Geneva, etc. H. George, 1873, contains lists of scientific names objectively and personally compiled. Cattell, J. McKean, A Statistical Study of Eminent Men, Popular Science Monthly, February, 1903, page 359 to 377. Abstract and Psychological Review, March, 1895. The names of a thousand eminent men of all time are here arranged in the order of their eminence by the strictly objective and valuable space method. Attempts should be made to test the limits of the accuracy of this method by comparing these names with those selected by other methods. Cattell, J. McKean, A Statistical Study of American Men of Science. Science, November 23, November 30, December 7, 1906. Although the facts are not drawn from history, they are useful as a check to compare with historical statistics. The names were selected by the method of voting. Ellis, Havelock, A Study of British Genius, London, Hurst and Blackett, 1904. First appeared in Popular Science Monthly, February, September, 1901. Available study based on the Dictionary of National Biography contains lists of British men of genius and talent, objectively derived and useful for further study. Galton, Francis, Hereditary Genius, An Inquiry into Its Laws and Consequences, 2nd Edition, London, Macmillan, 1892. The earliest of biographical statistical studies, first published in 1869. Many of the lists of names are not compiled by any strictly objective method. Galton, Francis, English Men of Science, Their Nature and Nurture, London, Macmillan, 1874. Fellows of the Royal Society, Galton, Francis, and Shuster, E., Noteworthy Families, London, Murray, 1906. Families of Scientific Men Objectively Studied. Jacoby Paul. Etudes sur la Selection chez le Homme. Avant Propos per Gabriel Tade. Second Edition, Paris, Alcan, 1904. The last quarter of this work dealing with the origin of French men of talent has decided scientific value. The first portion of the book deals with royalty, Le Pavoir, contains no statistical treatment as entirely misleading. Lorenz, Otakar, Le Buc de Gesamanten Wissenschaftlichen Genealogie, Stamborn und Amantafel in Erre Geschichtlichen Sociologischen and Naturwissenschaftlichen, Bidudang, Berlin, Hertz, 1898, suggested at the time it was written, but contains scarcely any statistical treatment.
Odin, A. Genes des Glens Holmes, Gens de Letters Francies Modernes, Two Volumes, Paris, H. Wilter, 1895, A Study of 6,382 French Men of Letters. Valuable for its facts, the conclusions are often unwarranted. Woods, Frederick Adams, Mental and Moral Hereditary and Royalty, A Statistical Study in History and Psychology with 104 Portraits, New York, H. Holt, 1906. Abstract in Popular Science Monthly, August 1902, April 1903. Brief Abstract in Psychological Review, March 1902. The individuals are included in the study by a strictly objective plan. Attempt is made to reduce the subjective element to a minimum, while grading them to a scale of 10 by averaging opinions of historians. Conclusion that hereditary outweighs environment is arrived at by several statistical methods. The general method of averaging opinions is shown to be practical and to give orderly results, harmonious with the researchers in hereditary. Human heredity shows to be alternative, non-blending. The Great Men of France, 19th Century. From London Times in Science, January 11, 1907. Names were obtained by popular vote. Frederick Adams Woods, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. End of section 23. Section 24 of The Influence of Monarchs by Frederick Adams Woods. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Appendix 3. Reprinted from Science, N.S., Volume 33, Number 850, page 568 to 574, April 14, 1911. Histriometry as an Exact Science In the issue of Science for November 19, 1909, under the title, A New Name for a New Science, I propose the term histriometry for that class of researchers in which the facts of history have been subjected to statistical treatment according to some method of measurement, more or less objective or impersonal in its nature. These researchers have chiefly had in view the listing and grading of historical characters over the purpose of studying mental hereditary or for the better appreciation of problems associated with the psychology of genius. Researchers of this type are capable of a far greater expansion and application than is generally supposed. They can be applied to events as well as to individuals. They can by treating the vast store of human records which exist in books as material for the construction of an exact science, work towards the solution of a wide range of historical problems, such as the causes underlying the rise and fall of nations, or other fundamental questions in history. Before anything can be done which shall give general satisfaction and agreement, it will be necessary for this subdivision of science to justify itself, to measure its own shortcomings, to appreciate its own limitations, as well as to prove its own right to recognition of independent estate. If we are to further historical causation by objective methods, it is obligatory first to prove that history itself, as we commonly find it in the printed records, is a sufficiently valid account of what actually happened. Second, it was equally necessary to find proof that the objective methods correctly deal with these facts. It might be supposed that the second proof awaits the first, but this is not necessarily so. If the records themselves were very much at fault, so that the statements of historians were very far from ideal truth, or if the objective methods of collecting and analysing these statements were subject to a large error, or if both these forces were in play, then it would be difficult to find wherein the trouble lay. But if, on the contrary, it fortunately be that history, as we find it in its important statements, a fair representation of the truth, and the methods of histriometry which deal with these records are also sound, then it is not difficult to prove both propositions at the same time. I will give some instances to illustrate this, which show that such is the case for several types of historical records and for several methods of history measurement. This could not be done did we not possess some third criterion, some third standard of comparison of a non-historical nature. One such non-historical criterion is furnished by the known correlation ratios for resemblances between close blood relatives as determined in the anthropometric laboratory. These have been worked out and accurately measured for mental and moral traits, stature, head index, and length of forearm. I have shown in hereditary and royalty 
that if the members of royal families are graded by the objectives applied to them by historians and encyclopedists, and then the coefficients of resemblance are measured between the near of kin who have been so graded, these coefficients, histriometric, substantially agree with the anthropometric. Such would not be the case if historians prevented the truth greatly, or if for any other reason the truth were largely unattainable. To make this clear, it is only necessary to think what the result would be if history were merely a pack of lies agreed upon, as the extreme view puts it. We should then fail to properly pick out our true intellectual giants and runts. The result would be nothing but confusion. A whole series of errors would be distributed at random. It should act like rain on waves and flatten down to a common level through all differences between the individuals. The correlation measurements would fall and we should get no results comparable to those obtained from the delicate and accurate measurements of the anthropometric laboratory. Furthermore, any weakness in the method of grading, any failure to properly classify the great man in the high grades and the degenerates in their proper grades would work in precisely the same direction to lower the correlation coefficients. The supposed errors of history and the difficulties of grading act as two united strains of tension to pull the coefficients down towards zero, which would be the coefficient for random distribution. If the coefficient can stand the strain without declining, then roughly speaking, we may conclude both that the historical foundation is just and that the method of procedure is sound. There are two other illustrations of method which I would like to summarize here. One of these series of tests is the trying out of a standard biographical dictionary, historical persons, against two lists of contemporaries, non-historical persons, and all three in terms of still another set of facts, namely birthplaces of distinguished Americans. The second series of tests concerns the relative fame of Euripides versus Sophocles, the encyclopedias having been used and then this compared with expert modern criticism and both with the opinions of the Athenians. As concerns American history, one fact is very evident at the start. Whatever be the method of grading as applied to Americans, or whatever be the mental eminence graded, some states in the Union, some sections of the country, have produced more eminence than others far beyond the expectation from their respective white populations. In this regard, Massachusetts always leads, and Connecticut is always second, as certain southern states are always behind, and fail to render their expected quota. I have already pointed out that the ratios seem orderly for the first approximation. That is, the higher the grade of the individuals, the greater and greater becomes the proportion of those born in Massachusetts. This may be expressed as a ratio, P, into the random expectation. Thus, if there were no forces at work beyond chance distribution, the ratios for all sections of the country will be expressed by unity, P equals 1. If there be found twice as many persons born in a certain locality as one would expect from the population, let it be expressed as P equals 2, 3 times as many, P equals 3, etc. These ratios are easily computed and can be expressed as fractions or with decimals. I have computed these ratios for the 13 original states, but will present here only the statistics from Massachusetts and Virginia. It will be seen in Table 1 that Massachusetts has never failed to produce twice as many eminent men as the population would lead one to expect, and has, for some ranks and types of achievement, produced about four times the expectation. P ranges between 2.1 and 4.7. Virginia, on the contrary, has but rarely produced as many as might be expected from a large white population, and the ratios in the same table are either below the expectation or not significantly above it. The other New England states, statistics not here given, have all done more than their share, but always less than Massachusetts. New York gives a trivial, though constant express above the expectation. From here southward the ratios draw suddenly, so that New Jersey, Delaware, Pennsylvania, Maryland, North Carolina, and Georgia have always furnished less than their share. For South Carolina, the ratios again rise and exceed the expectation, but only by the slightest measurable amount. North Carolina, of all the 13 original states, has always had the worst record in the way of producing distinguished men. The ratio is falling to about one quarter of what might be expected from the white population. Table 1 is displayed on the previous page. Displayed on the page are four columns titled the list of names, 
Total on the list born in USA, number born in Massachusetts, number born in Virginia, and the ratios or number of times and random expectation according to the population at the time of their birth, divide between Massachusetts and Virginia. Table 1 is also continued on the additional page. Regarding the tables for the two contested states, Massachusetts and Virginia, and following down through the commas marked ratios and number of times, the random expectation according to the population at the approximate age of their birth. One sees first that the Massachusetts ratios run from 2.1 to 3.9, and the Virginia from 0.2 to 1.1. The higher Massachusetts ratios are associated with a list of names in which the standards for admission to the lists are higher, that is, specially selected groups of the more eminent. Massachusetts also shows an extra merit when science or literature is alone considered, but this is merely an accentuation of some cause or causes which have enabled her to lead, no matter what type of success be the criterion. There has also been seen a probably significant gain in the ratios for Massachusetts from the census of 1790 to 1850. A further study of this special phenomenon might develop some interesting conclusions. The ratios also rise when only those in living cots are considered who have received adjectives of praise. Nine-tenths of the persons named in this dictionary are given a passing note by the editors and nothing critical is said of their lives or their work beyond the birth record. But one-tenth receives such adjectives of praise as celebrated, illustrious, eminent, famous, noted, etc. A priority, we may suppose that these represent an extra superior group as compared with the other nine-tenths. A posteriori, the supposition is verified, because how else can be explained the rise in the ratio from Massachusetts from 2.8 to 3.8? If this adjective method did not select a superior group, it would not raise the ratios, or in other words, draw it further away from random hazard for which P equals 1. The more accurately it seizes hold of the right persons and justly expresses real differences dependent upon natural causes, the more it will raise this ratio. One can now see how it is possible in this way, and in similar ways, to actually test the validity of any method of selection. Its value depends, among other things, on its ability to raise or lower a ratio in a proper degree, suitable to the case in hand, so that the ratio shall fit in and harmonize with the ratios and other results. If, for instance, the space method or the selecting of 234 men who have added the most space allotted to them in the dictionary, had not raised the Massachusetts ratio from 2.8 any more than, say, 2.9 or 3.0. We might be justified in concluding that this method was inferior in accuracy to the objective method. As it turns out, it raises the ratio to 3.6. So one suspects that the space method is not quite as accurate as the objective method, since it does not raise the ratio as much, though it deals with a small group. Of course, one instance like this does not decide anything. I merely give it as an illustration of the ways in which histriometry may proceed. I have also assayed a new method, namely, selecting from Libincott's list, composed of all those Americans whose biographies have been written and published in separate works. This constitutes a very small and presumably correspondingly select group, 129 in number, the ratio for Massachusetts here is seen to rise to 3.9, practically the maximum. It should, of course, do so if the method is sound and is successful in seizing hold of the right man. This may prove a very accurate, practical and rapid method of objectively listing great men in ancient or modern history, subject, of course, to such limitations and adjustments as special problems may require. It can be seen that the general raising of the ratio is in no way dependent on the dictionary containing a large number of clergymen and writers. As a matter of fact, more than a third of the names are those of lawyers, bankers, merchants, politicians, government officials, soldiers, manufacturers and engineers. Here, by narrowing the list from 1,266 to 232, and dealing with only a small group, we raise the ratio from 2.4 to 3. It might be supposed by some that a greater attention is shown Massachusetts by writers of books, biographies, and histories, because these writers live in the neighborhood. Libicott's Biographical Dictionary, however, is published in Philadelphia. Still, it may be influenced by previous writings and early biographical dictionaries published in the neighborhood of Boston. If this is so to any appreciable extent, 
that we should expect the ratio of Massachusetts to fall when present-day persons are graded by methods which have either nothing or little to do with historical traditions. To such methods of grading we fortunately possess in the compilations known as Who's Who in America and American Men of Science, the ratios of Massachusetts do not fall. They dovetail in with the ratios from Lippincott's. Hence we may conclude that the differentiations found in Lippincott's are not caused by unjust historical traditions, and furthermore, as far as one can see, they are not in part caused by the same. Who's Who in America has been often used as an objective basis for sociological inquiries, but the criticism has been made in this book gives undue inclusion of authors and professors. I think this criticism is unjust. About 40% of the whole four are the more practical types enumerated in Table the First. These are considered separately as far as initials A, B and C. The order ratio for Massachusetts of P equals 2.5, which is very close to that of the whole book, P equals 2.6. The same for Lippincott's is P 2.4, which is not in its exact theoretical position, as it should be higher than that drawn from who's who in America. It will, of course, be appreciated that the clearing up of small disagreements like this requires further analysis and the computation of the probable errors. The ratios from Virginia and the first present in this abstract merely as a general contrast to Massachusetts. I prefer to make further statistical inquiries before attempting to interpret their meaning. The third series of tests which illustrate the exactitude of histriometry are drawn from comparative studies of the fame of Euripides and Sophocles. In Science, October 7th, 1910. Mr. C. A. Brown caught it into the fact that Sophocles received the first prize from the Athenians twenty times, and Euripides only four times, while since their deaths, various writers from Plato to Emerson have referred to the quoted Euripides more than Sophocles. Mr. Brown also shows that both Curtius and Groot, and biographical dictionaries, and encyclopedias as well, a lot more space to Euripides than they do to his elder rival. This seems to indicate that the opinion of the Athenians has been reversed by posterity, but the real explanation I have found to be otherwise. Table 2 is displayed on the previous page, with three columns of authorities, Sophocles and Euripides, that are further divided between space lines or pages, and adjectives pro and con. It appears that the problem that Mr. Brown proposes is a very delicate one. These two great Greek dramatists stand in such an exalted position and so close to one another, both being near the extreme range of human genius, that probably not two hundred individuals who ever lived had exceeded them in eminence. Therefore, compared with all men of all historical time, these two are almost merged in something like a point at the extreme end of a line. It's like splitting and measuring the components of a binary star at a great distance. It would be no discredit to any objective method of differentiation if it failed to give interpretive conclusions. As it is, it turns out that the problem presented is just within the limits of histriometric discrimination so that figures yield uniformity and repetition warranting real conclusions. I have extended Mr. Brown's list, and I found confirmation of this statement that more space is devoted to Europeans than to Sophocles. This would leave the impression that Europeans is today frankly considered the greater of the two, which is not the impression that one gains by even a cursory reading of the printed matter so spaced. Furthermore, I am informed by John Williams White, Professor of Greek, Emeritus of Harvard University, that for the last hundred years a general estimate of scholars has placed Sophocles above Euripides. This is precisely the conclusion which is obtained from the extraordinary character of some of the terms and sentences of eulogism which one finds applied to Sophocles. In these times, authorities one never finds, for Euripides, anything like the following. There has hardly been any poet whose works can be compared with those of Sophocles for the universality and durability of their moral significances. Of all poets of antiquity, Sophocles has penetrated most deeply into the recesses of the human heart. Muller and Donaldson He renders tragedy a perfect work of ideal art. R.C. Jeb Occasionally the direct comparison is made, and then Europeite suffers, for instance, as when Gilbert Murray says, No wonder Sophocles won four times as many prizes as Europeites. 
Sophocles shows at times one high power which but few of the world's poets share with him. In the second, Oedipus, there is a certain depth of calm feeling, unfettered by any movement of mere intellect, which at times makes the subtlest and boldest work of Europe's same young man's poetry by comparison. It can be easily seen that this general impression can be checked up as unfairly expressed by each ratio of the adjectives of praise, pro, against those of dispraise, con. For every single authority consulted, the answer is the same. The proportion of ratio favors Sophocles. The space method fails here to give a verdict agreeing with modern ancient opinion, probably for special reasons peculiar to the case. More plays of Europeans are extant, and there is more to be said in the way of adverse or qualifying criticism. It is not to be denied that the interest in Europeans is and always has been intense, perhaps greater than in Sophocles, but the position of the latter is more majestic and more sublime. The lexicons alone would have given this conclusion in a few minutes' reading. All these facts, in connection with those taken from Lipcott's dictionary, indicate that the adjective method is a very delicate way of measuring small differences, if for any reason is desirable to do so. The questions here touched upon concern only the individuals, but I know from material as yet unpublished that the quantitative adjective method can be applied to events as well as to persons. If its validity for the study of individuals can be securely granted, then its application to events will naturally follow, and I will thereby the more easily and surely is established. Space has permitted only a brief abstract, but I think that enough has been given to prove that researches of this nature furnish harmony and order, intertwine and mutually support each other, form an organic structure, and are entitled to recognition among the exact sciences. It must be remembered that exactitude in science is a relative term. Abstract mathematics may be exact, but no science of physical measurement is really exact. Astronomy, which is usually thought of in this way, only gives an approach towards an ever-expanding ideal. No two new observers have ever been quite agreed upon the latitude of the Greenwich Observatory, and the last transit of Venus was, if I remember rightly, in comparison with the computer prediction, some eleven seconds off. All we ask is that the exactitude shall be sufficient for the practical needs of the problem in hand. I think it must be agreed that this first synthesis and coordination of isolated researchers presents a very encouraging picture. It indeed is proof that a workable instrument has been obtained capable not only of dealing with questions as intricate as human nature and its attributes, but actually at the same time demonstrated the essential validity of the historical data on which are based the percentile grades, ratios, correlations and other superstructures. This latter conception is to me the most interesting side of the whole matter. It has usually been impossible to scientifically refute those critics who claim that the so-called facts of history are so uncertain and subject to so great an error and prejudice that it is unsafe to build conclusions upon them by statistical methods. They have not, of course, ever known that such was the case, nor have they ever had any way of estimating how far the records of history as they exist in standard works, encyclopedias, and biographical dictionaries actually deviate from the absolute truth. It has been assumed, on the other hand, by those who have been engaged in grading historical characters, that the records represent a fair approximation towards the ideal truth. The human record which we call history stands somewhere between two extremes, somewhere between the quagmire of complete falsehood and heights of perfect truth. It is possible, as we go on to appreciate, with closer and closer accuracy, just what deviation from ideal truth any great set of historical records contains. Such researchers give promise of at last finishing the long-sought correct method of penetrating the tangled and perplexing jungle known as philosophy of history. This domain of thought is today in poor esteem among those who, as historians of the modern school, seeking documentary sources to reconstruct the past around some central theme, some individual age or nation. No wonder these careful investigators have become distinguished with the a priori dogmatism, the Bartesian spirit, the free generalizations from half-truths, and the eternally conflicting conclusions. Historical philosophers, in the desire to explain everything at once, have been content to formulate theories, and then pick from the totality of history selected facts to support them. With methods highly subjective, and carrying a large personal equation, they could not help but find exactly what they wished. The ways of the inductive science 
may be slow at first, but even a small nucleus of collected and coordinated facts soon grows with astonishing rapidity, and a re-objectively established piece of work makes it, with accelerated speed, that much easier to progress along lines of certainty and exactitude. Frederick Adams Woods, Massachusetts Institute of Technology End of section 24 And the end of The Influence of Monarchs by Frederick Adams Woods Recorded by Leon Harvey